म्यूट कर दे म्यूट कर दे कैमरा ऑफ कर
আঙুল পড়ে গেলে Good morning. Am I audible to all of you? Good morning. Am I audible to all of you? Can you confirm? You confirm the term so I can make it on the chat. Yes. Okay, they can hear us. Okay. So a very good morning to one and all. Uh, my name is Shagotam Dash, and uh, I am the program chair of uh, this Winter School on Deep Learning. We are going to start very shortly, but before the inaugural talk begins, just a few words about this particular program will be in order. 
So I hope many of you will join very soon online or offline. For offline, you have to come to the PJ Auditorium of Indian Statistical Institute. And uh, so let me start with a few words about this particular program. We flagged off the first chapter of the winter school of deep learning last year with great rigor and head full of ideas. We managed to reach 190 candidates with more than 130 hours of tutorial material. Among the 130 plus hours of class material that took place over two month period contained more than 120 hours of theory and hands-on lectures and with an additional 10 hours of doubt clearing. So our 19 regular course instructors were from internationally acclaimed educational institutes all over the world. In 2022, WSDL was you know, honored by the presence of seven plenary speakers, Professor C.V. Jawahar, Barbara Hammer, Nikhil Shri Chawla, Jason Du, Pratik Jain, Prabal Choudhury, and Vink in Balasubramaniam, who are all renowned for their seminal contributions in applied and theoretical machine learning. The lineup also included special talks from nine young scientists. Some notable courses from last year that were received with great appreciation by the audience and participants were meta learning and two shot learning, attention models and transformers, and of course, geometric deep learning among the others. So in this year's installment, we take our journey with near about 400 participants. Building upon last year's success, we aim to expand the reach and scope of the workshop. So we maintain the benchmark with 130 plus hours of course material, ranging from rudiments of machine learning and statistical theory to cutting edge research on diffusion models. Learners will be guided with real-time hands-on tutorials alongside precise theoretical ideas. We have significantly increased our footprint this year with students and professionals joining in from diverse backgrounds. The illustrious lineup of plenary speakers marks our tremendous progress. We have some of the leading thinkers and innovators in the world and its staff. During this two-month workshop, you will hear from Geoffrey Evers Sinton, Turing Award Fellow of Royal Society and arguably one of the most important computer scientists of our time. Diederik P. Kingma, the inventor of radiational autoencoders and the atom optimizer. Gerard Biao, professor of LPSN Sorbonne University and the recipient of the Mikhail Montefit Inria Prize by the French Academy of Sciences. Mikhail Delkin, receiver of the NSS Career Award and the Google Research Award 2019. Lawrence Van der Nathen, inventor of the widely appreciated dimensionality reduction technique called e stochastic neighbor embedding. Lehman Apoglu, the Hume's College Dean's Associate Professor in Information Systems at the Carnegie Mellon University. Timnit Gebru, the founder and executive director of the Distributed Artificial Intelligence Research Institute and recipient of the AI Innovations Award in the category AI for Good for their research highlighting the significant problem of algorithmic bias in facial recognition in 2019. Gebru was included in a list of 10 scientists who had important roles in scientific development in 2021, compiled by the uh, scientific journal Nature. And finally, Thomas Peake, senior research scientist at Google Brain, and also one of the pioneering figures in graph machine learning and graph neural networks. We also have special lectures lined up to diversify your palette even more. Uh, we are delighted to announce some of the notable industries like Martin Reed Miller from Google DeepMind, Danita G. Sutherland from University of British Columbia, Shubhrojit Roy from Google Brain London, uh, Rohan Mukherjee from Amazon Alexa. This year also we offer advanced courses based on ongoing research, both in our lab and other ones across the world. 
some notable mentions are explainable artificial intelligence, diffusion based generative models, and deep reinforcement learning. Some noteworthy mentions in real life applications that would be covered are medical image analysis and COVID detection, business analytics and time series forecasting, graph data analysis, and federated learning. So, with this, uh, this is uh, in a nutshell a summary of this year's winter school on deep learning. So we are very delighted to see that Professor Hinton has joined us. And uh, uh, can you unmute? We have to unmute him. Yes, the permission. So Professor Hinton, can you hear us from here? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, can you can, can you hear you? me? Yes, we can hear you very clearly. Uh, could you please share your screen just for testing? Maybe. I can't hear anything. So are you able to share your screen? Oh. Okay, I can share my screen now, yes. yes. Yeah, fantastic, we can see your slide. Okay. Don't look at that one. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Okay. The pipes are rolling. Thank okay. you very much. So let me know when you'd like me to start. Yeah, in five minutes, maybe. Okay. So, uh, good morning, one and all, once again. We are delighted to have Professor Geoff Everett Hinton among us. Uh, Professor Geoff Hinton received his PhD degree in artificial intelligence from the University of Edinburgh in 1978. He spent five years as a faculty member at the Carnegie Mellon University, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and he is currently a distinguished professor at the University of Toronto and a distinguished researcher at Google. Professor Hinton co-founded and became the chief scientific advisor of the Vector Institute in Toronto. He received the Turing Award in 2018 for his foundational research that led to the formation of deep learning as we know it now. He's a fellow of the Royal Society and an honorary foreign member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His illustrious cabinet of accolades includes awards such as the David E. Rubenhardt Prize, and the International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence Research, Research Excellence Award, just to name a few. But beyond these awards and accolades, he is very well known to us right from the beginning of our studies in machine learning because of his seminal contributions. And if I start to talk about them, it will take a whole day to finish, maybe. Some of them just include Boltzmann machines, distributed representation, time delay neural network, mixture of experts, variational learning, contrastive divergence learning, deep belief net, uh, and more recently, the capsule network. We are extremely delighted once again to have him among us, at least virtually. Uh, 
And all of us who try little our hand on the machine learning research are like his students. Although we could learn only from his uh, lectures, online lectures, videos, and of course his seminal papers that he has published over his last Australia. So now, may I request our uh, officiating director, Professor Dikti uh, Toshat Mukhopadhyay, to say just a few words to welcome Professor Hinton. Soon after this, his talk will commence. Okay, so uh, good morning, participants here. And uh, Professor Hinton, should I say good evening or good night? Or uh, okay, welcome to this uh, second edition of this uh, winter school on deep learning. Uh, uh, we are uh, from the on behalf of the Indian Statistical Institute, and which uh, many of the participants may know that uh, we founded by one of the uh, one of the pioneering personality of India in uh, during the early 1900, Professor Prashant Chandra Mahalanobis. And um, so it's a, it's a it's a real pleasure and it's an honorary experience for all of us that in an institute which was uh, founded by Professor Mahalanobis. Uh, and, and today we are going to have the second edition of this, uh, uh, this deep learning school. Uh, I understand that this is primarily a, uh, our research scholar initiated activity. So I really want to thank them. I wanted to uh, uh, put in my acknowledgement of their great effort for last few months. I know that uh, they're involved in organizing this. So thank you all these organizers. The second point, of course, is what I'd like to mention is that even from the experience of the first uh, school that uh, uh, since the, the community is growing, the number of participants is big, are big. <clears throat> what is happening is there might be a chance of gap between some initiators in this field and some of the experts in the field. So for the organizers, I request that please think of bridge lectures or bridge seminars where we can actually grow the entire community together. So there are many uh, initial uh, learners uh, among us. So, so that it would be good if we, if we have an extra thought and extra mind for this person. Okay, so with these few words, uh, welcome you all once again to the Indian Statistical Institute. Uh, Professor Hinton, um, it's really sad that uh, you are with us, but uh, virtually, not physically. Uh, it's also winter time here in Calcutta, but uh, probably we are really on the positive side of the centigrade scale, you are on the negative side. And um, so maybe we'll have opportunity that you will come visit us, uh, spend a few days with us, just like uh, Ronald Fisher spent here some time, or just like Kolmogorov came to this campus. So this is really uh, the campus where, where people have, uh, people of notable uh, backgrounds came over the years and spent some time, not only one or two days, but, but few months. So uh, Professor Hinton, Please find an opportunity. We'll be glad to host you here in, in Calcutta. And also, we have our branches in Delhi or Bangalore and other places. So uh, please plan and let us know. And uh, not only Professor Hinton, there are other uh, speakers from the other side of the globe. And we all welcome them here. And we'll be glad to host them at some point of time. With these uh, words, uh, welcome you once again. And thank you for your time. So thank you, Professor Mukhopadhyay, for your brief uh, welcome speech. And uh, I hope all the participants who are online, you can hear us clearly, right? Just a few times we need to ask this to check everything. Yeah, OK. Thank you, thank you. We can see your response on the chat. On the chat and to this mic. Yeah, OK. So now I welcome uh, Professor Hinton to start uh, with his speech. So Professor Hinton, the floor is all yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introductions. Um, 
What I'm going to talk about today is an algorithm called the forward forward algorithm. And before I talk about the algorithm itself, I need to explain why I'm interested in this kind of algorithm. So at present, all of the impressive applications of deep learning use the backpropagation algorithm, which is simply a version of the chain rule for computing gradients, in order to figure out how to change a weight that connects two neurons so as to make the whole system perform better. And backpropagation now works so well in large systems like large chatbots and large systems for generating images or for describing images um, that neuroscientists would be very interested now in whether the brain might be doing backpropagation. But nobody's been able to figure out how it could be implemented in cortex, despite quite a lot of effort. And there's no convincing evidence that cortex actually sends signals which represent error derivatives. And backpropagation through time, which is what you use in language models, is wildly implausible. Um, it will be particularly bad if you're trying to process video because you'd have to interrupt the flow of the video pipeline in order to send information backwards to get gradients. And if you look at the anatomy of the brain, particularly the perceptual system, the visual system, the anatomy isn't right for doing backpropagation. So between two cortical areas that are parts of the visual system, there are forward connections and backward connections, but the backward connections don't go to the same neurons as the forward connections come from. In fact, if you take one cortical area and ask how many neurons you have to go through before you get back to a neuron in that cortical area, it's about six neurons. You have to go through several neurons in each cortical area before you get back to the first cortical area. And so it, it's not at all right for doing backpropagation. It is right for propagating activity around loops, um, but that's something else. And the final point about backpropagation is backpropagation relies on having a precise model of the forward computation. You have to know exactly what happened in the forward pass to know how to send derivatives backwards. And if you have a system where you don't have a precise model of how the system works, it's very difficult to use backpropagation. So I believe the brain is using a different algorithm. Um, it has to be capable, maybe not as capable as backpropagation. So if you look at the big language models we have now, they have far fewer connection strengths than we have in the brain, but they know a lot more than we do. The sense in which they know it is still not very clear, but they know an awful lot of facts that no one person knows in far fewer connections. So it may well be that backpropagation is actually better at squeezing information into a few, into a relatively small number of connections, like a trillion. I quite enjoy telling a statistical institute that a trillion is a small number of parameters. Um, but compared with the brain, it is. We have about 100 trillion. And Cortex has a different problem from these big models. The problem with these big models is how to squeeze lots of information into as few connections as possible. Cortex has many more connections, but has much less training data. So the problem for Cortex is you have about 10 to the 14 connections, connection strengths, but you only live for about 10 to the 9 seconds. Fortunately for some of us, it's about two times 10 to the nine, um, but you get much less experience than you have parameters. So Cortex needs an algorithm that'll work in that regime, which is a very different regime from what backpropagation is normally used in. So I want to talk a bit about a different kind of computer. When computers were originally designed, they were made so that they faithfully implemented the instructions they were given. And that's because Everybody assumed that the way you get a general purpose computer to do a specific thing that you want it to do is by writing a program. That is, you give it instructions telling it exactly what to do. That's no longer true. So these big neural nets, they're general purpose, but you can get them to do particular things by just showing them a lot of training data. And that's very different from giving them a program. Obviously, there has to be a program inside that has the learning algorithm. But to learn a specific task, they get it from the data, not from you writing a program. 
And I think the research community has been slow to realize that that means the whole way we think about computation may need to change. Not for all the computations we do. We still want digital computers that do exactly what you tell them to. Um, you want those to keep your bank account and know how much money you've got in it and to do all sorts of things. Uh, other things like figuring out exactly how to land a spacecraft on the moon. Um, Backpropagation is very good for that. But for many other things, we might be able to make a completely different kind of computer. And this different kind of computer we, is solving very different problems from what digital computers were designed for. So a fundamental principle of computer science is that there should be a separation between the software and the hardware. That is, you should be able to run the same program on a different physical computer. As soon as you can do that, it means the program is immortal. The program doesn't rely on any particular physical computer still being alive. As long as you can represent the program somewhere, in some memory somewhere, then you can run it on any one of a number of computers. So the program is immortal in that sense. And that's true for neural nets too. If you have the weights of a neural net, you can run them on many different pieces of hardware. But in order to achieve that, all those different pieces of hardware have to behave in exactly the same way at the level of the instructions. And in order to achieve that, we run transistors at very high power so that they're digital. And that means we can't make use of all sorts of complicated, rich, analog, but unreliable properties of hardware, particularly hardware that you're running at very low power. There's a lot more sort of computation available in low power hardware, but we don't know how to make use of it because it's not the same every time. You can't make many different copies of the same hardware that behave in exactly the same way. The other thing that comes out of having digital computers that you write programs for is that you need to fabricate the hardware very precisely. You need a big factory in Taiwan that can fabricate it very precisely so that it will behave exactly as specified. Now there's a completely different possibility and I call this mortal computation. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna abandon the thing that's most dear to computer scientists, which is the separation of hardware and software. Um, we're gonna say that the actual hardware we have and all the funny quirks of the hardware are gonna be used for doing computation that will only work in that hardware. If you wanna do a similar computation in other hardware, you're gonna to have to learn different parameters for the other hardware. So the parameters you learn will be specific to a particular piece of hardware. And in that piece of hardware, we may not know a lot about how it works. We have to know enough so we can know how to change connection strengths to make it work better, um, at least locally. But there'll be lots of things about the hardware that aren't known. So we don't need to have a perfect model of it in this kind of computer. It can run at very low power, so maybe a thousandth of the power of a digital computer. But we need, instead of programming it now, we're going to get it to do particular things by having it learn. And every separate piece of hardware has to learn separately. There's a technique called distillation, which can help you get knowledge in one piece of hardware into another piece of hardware. But you can't directly ship the parameters across because the parameters only mean something relative to the hardware they're running in. And every piece of hardware is different. So what I'm looking for is an algorithm that will learn in the hardware. And I believe that's what the brain's got too. You can't share parameters between your brain and somebody else's brain because the hardware is all slightly different. As soon as we give up on the desire to share parameters, then we get all sorts of other possibilities, but we have to have a learning algorithm that'll run relatively efficiently in hardware where you don't know all the properties of the hardware. Just to give you an example of the kinds of things you can do in hardware, um, if you're allowed to be slightly unreliable, um, consider two ways of taking the product of a vector and a matrix. The standard method is you drive transistors at very high power, so they represent bits, they're digital, and then you perform a number of operations on bits, that's a number of bit operations that are proportional to the square of the length of the vector. Um, just to multiply two n-bit numbers. Um, 
And that's a lot of operations you're doing at high power. Now, there is a very simple way of multiplying a vector by a matrix in hardware. You can make the neural activities be voltages, then you can make the weights be conductances. They have to be variable conductances so you can learn them. And if you put a voltage through a conductance for a unit of time, what you get out is a charge, and charges add themselves. So we can do the multiply and the add by multiplying a voltage by a conductance and then just adding up the charge. And that's hugely more energy efficient than going to the digital representation and operating on the bits. But the problem is each time you do it, you're going to get a very slightly different answer. Your answer is going to be analog. And if you do it in a different piece of hardware, it's definitely going to be a little bit different. And so we need learning algorithms that can operate in regimes like that. So now I'm going to describe the forward-forward algorithm to you. Um, suppose we have a multi-layer neural network. The aim of the learning is to train each layer of the... Feed, let, let's start with the feed-forward network. So we're going to train each layer of the feed-forward network to have high goodness when you present it with a positive data. Yeah? That's an example from the training set. And low goodness when you present it with a negative negative data. That's a kind of contrastive data. It's something that it shouldn't like. And I'll explain more about negative data later. And we're going to train the layers greedily one at a time. So e all each layer is trying to do is get high goodness when you give it positive data and low goodness when you give it negative data. And it's very important that you have this contrast. There's many different ways to generate negative data vectors. As you're all aware, neural nets are now very good at generating visual images or videos. So in the long run, that's how we'd like to generate negative data. We'd like to generate it from the neural network. Um, but I'll describe some simpler ways of doing it. Each of the hidden layers in this network is going to be composed of rectified linear units, or ReLUs. And to begin with, we'll make the goodness of a layer. So the goodness is a property of a whole layer for now simply be the sum of the squares of the activities of the neurons. And what a hidden layer is going to compute is going to try and decide, and this is going to be decided separately by each hidden layer, whether the input data that it got, that the whole network got, is a positive example or a negative example, where positive examples are real data and negative examples are negative data. Um, and the way it decides is it takes the goodness of the layer, that's G, it subtracts off some threshold, it puts that through the logistic function, and that gives it the probability that it's a positive example. And it would like to change the weights. Obviously, the weights on the connections are determining the activities in the layer and therefore determining G. It would like to change the weights so that it's more confident the positive examples are positive and more confident the negative examples are negative. For negative examples, it would like this logistic to output something close to zero. So it would like G to be much less than the threshold. And for positive examples, it would like it to be much more than the threshold. And what we're actually going to do is take the derivative of the log probability of getting the right answer, which is what you always do in statistics. You want to maximize the log probability of getting the right answer. So if you do this for one hidden layer, it works fine. But then there's a problem, which is if you take the next hidden layer, it can very easily tell whether the input data was positive or negative by just looking at the length of the vector in the first hidden layer. And if it's a long vector, it says it's positive, And if it's a short vector, it says it's negative. So it doesn't need to find any new features. So to prevent that, what we're going to do is we're going to normalize the length of the first hidden layer vector. You can think of this a bit like you find the first principal component of some data, and then you remove that principal component from the data, and then you find the next principal component. Only we're doing this with layers. We're finding a way to get a nice long vector, a transformation of the input that'll give us a nice long vector for positive examples, but a short vector for negative examples. Once we've done that, we normalize the length of the vector, and then we do it again. So the second layer, can't see the length of the vector in the first layer, it can just see its orientation. That is the relative activities of units. So it has to learn to turn those relative activities into new features. Um, so it gets 
um, a long vector for positive examples and a short one for negative examples. So learning hidden representations without using any label information is a good thing to do if you want a big, if you want a big model that's general and can deal with all sorts of problems. But I'll start with dealing with a relatively small model where you only want to model the relevant properties of the input data for making a classification. And it looks to begin with that you're not going to be able to do that with the forward forward algorithm. How are you going to put the label in? Um, because you're just learning these layers one at a time, starting at the lowest layer and learning the next layer. And what we're going to do is we're going to put the label in at the input. So for positive images, we're going to include a correct label in the input. And for negative images, we're going to include an incorrect label. So we're going to, I'm going to start off using the MNIST database. Um, and they're handwritten digits with a big black board around them. And so what I'm actually going to do is put the label as part of the input in the border in a one of n representation. So I use the first 10 pixels to represent the label. And for positive images, I include the correct label. And for negative images, I include the incorrect label. And then we're just going to do this learning of trying to get long vectors for positive examples and short vectors for negative examples in multiple different layers. Once you've done the learning, you need to test it to see if it works. And there's a quick method of testing it. The quick method is you put in an image with a neutral label. So you take the first 10 pixels and make the activity of each of them be one tenth. That's a neutral label. And then you train a linear classifier that looks at the activities in all the hidden layers, puts those into a softmax. Um, that's what you'd call multinomial logistic regression and um, produces a probability distribution across labels. There's a slower and slightly better method, which is you take all your possible labels and you try them in turn with the image. So given an image that I want to classify, I try putting it in with one label and then the next label and then the next label. And for each label, I measure how happy the network is. And by happy, I mean how good the activity is in the layers. In other words, does it get big squared activities in all its layers? That's a very happy network. Um, and I find the label that makes the sum of the squared activities greatest in all the layers. That works slightly better. You can use that if you have a small number of labels. If you've got a large number of labels, it's hard to use that. So what you would do if you had, say, a thousand labels is you'd use the quick method to get a short list of labels, like five, five best candidates. And then for those, you would use the slow method to reorder them. So you're using, you're classifying them by using the function that you're actually optimizing, which is to get high activity for good images and well-labeled images and low activity for badly labeled images. So on the MNIST database, which I've spent a lot of time playing with, if you use a fully connected net and you don't use convolution, I don't want to use convolution because it's not biologically realistic. It involves sharing weights. Um, and you can't do that if you've got kind of irregular analog hardware. So I want to use a network that doesn't use weight sharing. And a fully connected network without weight sharing, if you train it with backpropagation, um, it gets about 1.4% errors, between 1.3 and 1.4%. And if you train this feed forward algorithm, it takes a bit longer, but it gets the same error rate on test examples, on held out test examples. Um, to get hard negative cases, obviously, if you put in an image and you put in a label that's very, that's obviously not right, it doesn't have to learn much. So what you want to do is put in a hard negative case. That is, you put in something like a three and you give it a false label that's a five, because threes are very confusable with fives. And you can find these hard negative cases as you're going by using the linear softmax classifier based on the network you've already learned to make guesses about what the answer is. And then pick from that distribution, but excluding the right label. And that'll give you a hard negative. And if you do that, it trains a lot faster. Um, 
So in order to get it trained in about 60 epochs, you have to do that. Otherwise, it takes several hundred epochs, where an epoch is a sweep through the 60,000 training examples. If you jitter the input images by up to two pixels in each direction, then, but still without using convolution, then it does much better because you're augmenting the training data. And then it gets about just over 0.6% set errors, which is very similar to what you get with a convolution on your own net. So jittering gives you the same effect as convolution for simple data like this. Um, obviously it's slower because instead of wiring in the fact that it generalizes across position, you've had to learn it from these jittered images. So here's an example of what it learns on MNIST. And what I'm showing you is pictures of the weights connecting the units in the first hidden layer to the pixels. So if you look at the, each of those boxes shows you the receptive field of a hidden unit. Um, that is the weights connecting it to the input. And if you, if you look at the first 10 pixels, you can see they're obviously different. They tell you which classes it's sensitive to. So if you look at the red box, which is shown larger on the right, you can see that it's particularly sensitive to threes and sevens. And if you look at the feature, you can see that those sort of two more or less horizontal white lines separated by a black line, that's a very good feature detector for detecting threes or detecting a seven with a crossbar across it. So that's why it likes threes and sevens. If you look at the other thing in the red box, that likes threes and fives. And again, it's a similar feature, but it's near the bottom. And you can see that it would be triggered by the loop of a three in one direction or the loop of a five in the other direction at the bottom. And so you can see the features make sense. Um, after it's learned for quite a long time, it has these nice features, that many of which make a lot of sense. And it does very well at the classification. So the algorithm actually works. The reason I use MNIST is because almost all the algorithms I think of don't actually work. And you might as well show that they don't work on a simple data set rather than spending a lot of computation showing they don't work on a big data set. Now, one major problem with this algorithm, at least if you're interested in psychology and how people's perceptual systems actually work, which is something I am interested in, um, what you learn in earlier layers doesn't affect what you learn in later layers. And that seems bad. Um, one of the nice things about backpropagation is modifications to the weights in later layers affect the signal that gets backpropagated, and therefore they affect the features you learn in earlier layers. And I would like to use this forward-forward algorithm that's doing two forward passes, one for positive data, one for negative data, to learn agreement between top-down predictions and bottom-up extractions of features from a context. Um, there's a lot of evidence that people are good at that. So let me show you some examples. If you look at those two words, the middle letter is identical in the two words. But if you don't focus on that letter, you just try reading the whole word. You see it as an H in the top word, as an A in the lower word. Your interpretation of the data depends on the context it's in, and you perceive it differently depending on context. If you look at the face on the right, you initially see it as a face. But the thing that you see as a nose, if you look more carefully, that's actually a pair. You just interpret it as a nose, not because of the features it itself has although it's roughly the right shape, but because of the context it's in. If it's roughly the right shape and it's in the right context, then you interpret it that way. So what that's telling us is the context is determining how you interpret individual features. And that strongly suggests the context provides a very good signal for learning how to extract individual features. So if you look at the sentence at the bottom, she scrummed him with the frying pan. You may never have seen the word scrummed before because I just made it up. You know it's a verb because of the ED on the end, or you, you suspect it's a verb. Um, 
But in one example, you've got a pretty good idea of what it means. It probably means she was cross with him and she hit him over the head with the frying pan. Um, it could mean um, she impressed him with her cooking, um, but it's more likely to mean she attacked him with the frying pan. And you know that from just one instance of the context. So all of these are evidence that the context provides a very valuable clue, cue that tells you how to, what features to extract or how to interpret local things in the data. And I'd like the forward-forward algorithm to exhibit similar phenomena. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to actually treat a static image as a very boring video, because your perceptual system is obviously set up to deal with video, a sequence of images, and it has to deal with data streaming in all the time. And so we'll take the simplest version of that by saying, we'll turn the static image into a video in which every frame is the same. And then what I can do is show you how you get top-down effects. So a couple of years ago, I produced a paper on um, what I, an architecture I call GLOM, which was meant to be a biologically realistic way of representing part whole hierarchies in cortex. But the problem was I didn't have a biologically reali realistic learning algorithm for it. We had to use things like backpropagation through time, which was crazy. And the feed forward, the forward, sorry, the forward forward algorithm is actually a much more biologically realistic learning algorithm for the GLOM architecture. So here's a picture of the GLOM architecture. We have various levels of representation that correspond to layers of a network. And so the bottom level might be subparts, and the middle level might be parts, and then the top level might be whole objects. We're going to feed in data, which in the general case will be video, but for now every frame will be the same. We're going to feed in the data over time at the low down. And each level in the hierarchy at each time step is going to be looking at the activities in the level below at the previous time step and the activities in the level above at the previous time step and also the activities at the same level at the previous time step. So those are the blue, the red, and the green arrows. And so if you look at the level L in the middle there on the right, the rightmost box for level L, it's getting three different inputs. In GLOM, it's actually getting another input as well from other modules. But for now, just think of these three different inputs. Um, and so its activity is determined both by what it gets bottom up and by what it gets top down as well as previous activity at its own level. And we can now take that kind of architecture and use it for recognizing handwritten digits. So what we're going to do is at the bottom, we're going to put in the pixels without the label. And at the top, we're going to put in the label now. And the label is going to be a one of n representation. Um, so now if you look at that middle level box, the right hand middle level box, you can see that it's getting bottom up input from the third frame and it's getting top down input from the first frame. So information from the first frame is going up to the level above and then coming back down. So it's getting information from the first frame, but that information is delayed. So contextual information that's come from a broader context and has come via higher levels is always going to be delayed relative to the bottom up information. So if you want the top down to match the bottom up, then the top down is going to have to be predictive. It's going to have to predict what comes next. For static images, that's easy. But as soon as you have things moving, and I've tried this now with moving things and it works, it has to predict not the current frame, but the frame. So what you get from frame one, when you go up to the top level and come back down again, has to predict what you'll see in frame three. Okay. And initially what I wanted to do is make the activity, let's think about the middle layer here, the activities in the middle layer, the squared activities be high for 
good examples when the label's correct and low when the label's incorrect. And what that means is I'd like that top-down input to match the bottom-up input. Later on, I discovered it worked better if you make try and make the activities low for good examples and high for bad examples. Um, and then what you want is for the top-down input to be the exact opposite of the bottom-up input. Either way, it will learn just fine. So the video pixels are the bottom layer. You clamp the top layer to the correct label for positive data and to an incorrect label for ne negative data. And then you run it for eight to 10 iterations. And the learning tries to make the hidden layers have high goodness, well above threshold for positive data and low goodness for negative data. Or you can reverse the sign of the goodness function and it works slightly better. And more recently in the last few days, I've tried using a different goodness function that works even better. And the different, different goodness function is to actually minimize the distance between the top down input and the bottom up input. So if you go here, if you look at the middle layer on the right, you want the input coming from that red arrow to be the same as the input coming from the blue arrow. And so you can think of, as soon as you try and make those two inputs the same, you can think of it like this. The top down input coming via the red arrow is a teaching signal for the bottom up input. What you expect to see there, given what you previously seen, acts as a teaching signal that allows you to extract the right thing, something that fits your expectations. Obviously, if what's there doesn't fit your expectations and you're fairly sure about it, that acts as a teaching signal to revise the contextual prediction. But what you've got here is at every level in the network now, the bottom up is teaching the top down and the top down is teaching the bottom up because it's trying to make them equal. Now for negative data, it's trying to make them not equal. And that's what stops the whole thing from collapsing. If you didn't have negative data, it could make the top down input be zero and the bottom up input be zero and say, look, they match perfectly for everything. And that's not an interesting kind of match, right? But if you can make the match for the positive data, match when things are correctly labeled and not match when things are incorrectly labeled, that's a much more interesting kind of matching because it allows you to identify the right label. So I tried this with two hidden layers, also three hidden layers, and I let it run for a few steps before I start collecting gradients for trying to, um, in this case, minimize the activities in the layer for positive examples and maximize them for negative examples. So I'm trying to make the top down be exactly the opposite of the bottom up. And I run for 60 epochs, and as I run, I decay the learning rate. And then, at test time, I use the expensive method of evaluating it um, by running the net iteratively with each of the 10 labels in separate runs and see which gives the highest goodness. And that gets about 1.3% error. So it's um, it seems to be slightly better than the system I showed you before. But I think it's much more interesting because it's explaining how you get these top-down effects. It's also interesting for another reason that I'll come to in a bit. Um, I've also tried this on data that's significantly more difficult, and that's the CIFAR 10 images. These are small images that are 32 by 32, but they have color, so they're um, 3,000 pixels per image. And because I'm not using convolution, because I want it to be biologically realistic, I just use local connect connectivity. So each hidden layer, the input is 32 by 32 and has three channels. And I make each hidden layer be 32 by 32 with three channels too. And, but those channels aren't red, green, and blue. Um, they're just whatever receptor feels it chooses to learn there. But at each location in a hidden layer, It'll have three neurons that have the same connectivity, and they look at 11 by 11 fields in the layer below, and they also project to 11 by 11 fields in the layer above, except for ones near the edge of the image. 
And that cuts down the total number of connections, which makes it generalized better. And if I take that architecture with these local receptive fields and two or three hidden layers, I can train it with backpropagation. It'll overfit, so I have to use quite a lot of weight decay. And if I do that, it doesn't do all that well. It doesn't do nearly as well as a convnet train carefully, but it does a lot better than random. Um, so the error rate, if you train it with backpropagation, for two layers it's 37%, and for three layers it's 39%. Um, those numbers are kind of not very accurate. This is These are just experiments done by me in a hurry. If I train it with the feed forward algorithm in a recurrent net, which of course takes longer, it doesn't do quite as well, but it does almost as well. It gets 41% error. And it's nice to see that as you had more hidden layers, the error doesn't get worse, at least not significantly. The difference between 37 and 39 might be just significant. I've done it a number of times, and it definitely seems backprop is happier in nets with two layers rather than three for this kind of architecture. The forward forward seems equally happy in both nets and is always a little bit worse than backpropagation. That's probably a significant difference, but not a very big difference. And it's interesting that it works there because for CIFAR, there's complicated backgrounds in the images, and many of the complicated backgrounds only occur once. So you can't possibly learn to model them. You've got to learn to ignore them. And this algorithm manages to do that. And that's one of the advantages of backpropagation as compared with generative models. It will learn to ignore things that are irrelevant. Okay, so I want to contrast what's going on here with backpropagation. If you were training with backpropagation, you do a forward pass through the network, just one forward pass, and then you send derivatives backwards. And the derivatives go backwards through n layers in n time steps. You're propagating derivatives, and that's efficient. And you get the exact derivatives, so you can change the weights in earlier layers. If you look what's happening in this kind of net, which I believe is much more like what's happening in the brain, you've got what you might call back relaxation. So in an intermediate layer, it's settling on a state that's a compromise between what the top-down information is telling it to do and what the bottom-up information is telling it to do. So the top-down information does have an effect, but at each step, that effect is diluted by the bottom-up information. They're not kept separate like they are in backpropagation, where you keep the bottom-up things quite separate from the top-down things. You mix the two kinds of information here. And so the top-down information gets more and more diluted as you go down through the layers. So in a deep net, the top-down information, when you show it an image, won't have much effect on what's going on in the early hidden layers. But it will have an effect on what's going on in later layers. And the learning will mean that the bottom-up connections change. And so now next time you present that image, what happens in an intermediate layer will be different. And so now you'll get information going further back down the network. So if you keep presenting the same image over time with learning, the information will get back to earlier layers. So back relaxation isn't as efficient as back propagation. It's diffusion rather than propagation. So it sort of gets through layers in a time proportional to n squared rather than proportional to n to get through n layers. But it's much more biologically realistic, I believe. And it's sufficient for learning networks that don't have that many layers. And in biology, you don't have that many cortical areas. You have five or six cortical areas in a row, but that's about it. Now, you could make this whole algorithm a lot more efficient, and that's what I'm working on now, by not having a single goodness function for a whole layer. You know that spatial information is local, and you'd like the lower levels of the network to be extracting local information. And so at lower levels, you can have groups of units that are spatially local and have goodness functions for these groups. So each local group of units is trying to decide whether it's a positive or negative example. And so for each local group, if you're trying to match the top down with the bottom up, it's trying to get a good match between top down information and bottom up information. And as you go up through the net, you make those groups bigger. At the top, they may be global. But now you can do lots of learning in parallel to low level without getting interference. So that should make it learn much faster. 
And there's a researcher in Amsterdam called Cindy Lowe, who works with Max Welling, who really got very impressive results using contrastive learning um, with local information. It's a somewhat different method from what I'm using, but it does show that local information with contrastive learning um, allows you to win. And I'm hoping you get a similar win. Now I want to talk about something that I think is really interesting. And when I talked, I talked about this at NIPS and I gave an example. And very embarrassingly, I discovered after I'd given the talk that there was a bug in my code. And the example that I gave wasn't working nearly as well as I thought it was. Luckily, I hadn't put the paper on archive yet. So I removed that example from the paper. And recently, I've got it working again. Um, I've got a slightly different version working. And the idea is that you have to do forward passes for positive examples. You also have to do forward passes for negative examples, which are wrongly labeled images or images generated by the model that aren't real. And you'd like to do those in separate phases. So the idea is that while you're awake, you just do, you're just operating on positive data. You're just seeing real data. And you're doing this positive learning of trying to raise the goodness in all these layers for positive data, where the goodness is now the match between top down and bottom up. So that's all you have to do. And that makes the learning algorithm much simpler. You don't have to do things with negative data at the same time. You also have to learn to generate data. Um, that's equivalent to learning top-down connections. Then you can have a separate phase called sleep. And in sleep, what you do is you use your model to generate negative data by repeatedly predicting the next video frame. And then you treat that data as negative data and you try and minimize the goodness of every layer. Now, a long time ago, in the early 1980s, around about 1980, Francis Crick and Graham Mitchison published a paper, which was a theory of sleep. And their theory was that when you're asleep, you're trying to get rid of things you shouldn't believe. And so you do unlearning. And that's why you don't remember your dreams. So I don't know if you're like me, but my dreams are actually considerably more interesting than reality. And if you wake me up in the middle of a dream, it's always something very interesting that happens that I'm very engaged in. Um, but I know I dream for, I mean, just by doing experiments, waking me up repeatedly, you can figure out I dream for many hours every night. But in the morning, I just remember the dream I had when I was waking up. I don't remember all the other dreams. I only remember dreams during which I woke up because then the information's in short-term weights and I can turn it into long-term memory from there. It's in temporary memory. But in the morning, you don't remember your dreams. And the question is why? Because they're really interesting. And that's easily explained if you say that the function of dreams is to get rid of things. So here for the forward-forward algorithm, what you're doing is you're taking negative data, that is, if you're learning to label images, images that are wrongly labeled, or if you're learning to generate images, images generated by the model, you're calling those negative data, and you're taking real images and calling those positive data. And if you try and maximize the goodness of the layers on real images and minimize the goodness on images you generated, what will happen in the end is the images you generate will look just like real images. That's what's going on in a GAN. Um, a generative adversarial net. So this also explains why you need sleep. So there are experiments done in Canada and funded, I believe, by the CIA, where they deprived people of sleep for many nights in a row. And people go psychotic. They start, After a few nights, they start having hallucinations. If you're completely deprived of sleep for a week, you go completely psychotic, and you may never recover. And none of the current theories of sleep explain why that is. They don't explain why it's completely devastating to be completely deprived of sleep. But this theory does. So if you take one of the networks I've been training, running forward passes while it's awake, you run a whole bunch of forward passes while it's awake, and then you run a whole bunch of forward passes on negative data while it's asleep, um, it'll learn fine. 
At present, I can train it on 20,000 positive examples, followed by 10,000 negative examples, and it'll learn okay. You just alternate between 20,000 positive examples and 10,000 negative examples. Um, but if you try and push it too far, if you give it too many positive examples without any negative examples, then there suddenly comes a point when everything starts collapsing. It starts making everything the same. All the top-down predictions and all the bottom line inputs all start becoming much too similar to one another. And it loses all its knowledge. And that happens relatively quickly. It happens in a few epochs. The whole thing just completely falls apart and loses everything it's learned. So to my knowledge, this is the first model that explains why why you why you need why you really need sleep this algorithm can't work without it and why it's devastating to remove it and all the animals we know sleep marine mammals have a problem because they have to breathe and you need a brain to get yourself to the surface so you can breathe and so they let one hemisphere sleep while the other one's awake and then do the opposite with the other hemisphere um but even things like fruit flies sleep fruit flies sleep for eight hours a night and if you deprive them of their sleep they get grumpy um, so, uh, this is obviously pure speculation at this point, but I think it's a much more interesting theory of sleep than the standard deep learning theory. So the standard deep learning theory would be, you have to integrate new information with old information. So what you do is in your hippocampus, you take, you store old information. And then when you're asleep, you, um, try learning on both the old information and the new information and that allows you to learn both at the same time and that's certainly an interesting effect but it doesn't explain why if i deprive you of sleep you just completely fall apart and go completely haywire um on that theory if i deprive you of sleep you just wouldn't be any good at integrating the new information um okay enough of that that's pure speculation at this point, but if it's right, it's a very interesting prop function of sleep. And it's it only happens for contrastive learning. These kind of contrastive learning algorithms need this negative phase. And putting this negative phase off until you're no longer online seems to be possible. And obviously there's big advantages to doing that. It makes everything simpler, both when you're online and when you're offline. Yeah, so what I managed to do recently, and when I say recently, I mean today, is I got it learning on 20,000 positive examples followed by 10,000 negative examples. Um, what happens um, is that when you're trying to make the top down and bottom up be similar, they'll tend to shrink. And when you're trying to make them be different, they'll tend to expand. So when you're awake, they're tending to shrink. And so to counteract that, you can put in a regularizer that stops them shrinking, um, just makes them get similar orientations. And that allows you to go for 20,000 positive examples. Now, I'd like to be able to go for 100,000 because 100,000 is two examples per second for 12 hours. And that seems like a reasonable length of time to be able to do learning for before you have to do some sleep. Um, but 20,000 is getting in the ballpark. And to get that to work, I had to use this match between top down and bottom up as a goodness function rather than the total activity of a layer. So I got ahead of myself when I said all that. Um, there's a very simple penalty term you can add, which is a penalty term on the log of the squared length of the activity vector. And that has very simple derivatives. And that way you can help stop things shrinking when it's awake. Now I want to compare the forward-forward algorithm with various other learning algorithms. So because of the paper by Crick and Mitchison on their theory of sleep, Terry Sanofsky and I, in 1982 and 1983, um, started wondering if we could get a maximum likelihood learning algorithm for Hopfield networks with hidden units 
And it turned out the maximum likelihood learning algorithm is a contrastive algorithm where you have to have positive examples and negative examples that are generated by the network. And um, we got Boltzmann machines out of that. And the interesting thing about Boltzmann machines is they don't use backpropagation. They run in two phases. In the positive phase, you clamp an image on the input and you let the hidden units settle. They have to settle to thermal equilibrium, what you would call the stationary distribution or close to the stationary distribution. And then once they've got to the stationary distribution, you just measure all the pairwise statistics. You measure with data clamped on the inputs, how often are two of the neurons on together? And you're going to increase the weight on the connection in proportion to how often they're on together, in proportion to their correlation. Um, and then with the negative data, you're going to not clamp anything. You're going to let the network generate its own images and let it settle to the stationary distribution. And again, you're going to measure these pairwise statistics and you're going to reduce the weights. So the net effect is the change in a weight is the difference in the correlation between two units with positive examples and with negative examples. So notice there's nothing like backpropagation there. The way you propagate activity is the same in both phases, just as it is with the forward forward algorithm. But to get it to work, you need to approach the stationary distribution for a multi-layer net. And that means you're using Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, which get to be very complicated and unwieldy. And you can't separate the phases in a Boltzmann machine. It's very important you have exactly the same number of positive and negative examples, and you interleave them. You can't do lots of updates on positive examples followed by lots of updates on negative examples. The network just goes completely crazy. So the difference between Boltzmann machines and the forward fold algorithm is one aspect of Boltzmann machines, which is to use positive and negative examples. I'm keeping that in the forward fold algorithm, but I'm making the energy function or the goodness function be much simpler than the free energy of a binary stochastic network. It's simply per layer, it's just the sum of the activities in the layers or the difference between the top down and bottom of inputs. Um, so it's a simpler energy function that is much easier to get and much easier to get the derivatives of, but with the same idea of positive and negative examples. So that's the relation to Boltzmann machines. Um, and one thing Boltzmann machines, Terry and I, when we designed them, we were very interested in how you prevent the network modeling its own wiring. So suppose you're a neuron deep within the brain and you're trying to figure out what to model. What you don't want to do is have two groups of neurons, each build a very good model of what the other group's up to, because that's telling you nothing about reality. It's a kind of folly idea where they're each modeling the other. It's kind of what goes on in social networks. Um, and it tells you nothing about reality. And the way to prevent that is to use these positive and negative examples because you're looking for differences with positive and negative examples. So when you find differences, there's something to do with reality. They're not just to do with the network's own wiring. And as an example of this, of the danger of modeling your own wiring, suppose you have purely random input vectors and you map them through a purely random weight matrix. And then you look at the activities in the hidden layer. Well, because of the weights in the weight matrix, those activities will have correlations. There might be two neurons that both have big positive weights connecting them to the same pixel. So they'll tend to be positively correlated. And any learning algorithm that's just without contrasting positive and negative data is going to find that correlation. And it's going to think it's discovered something about the world. But it's not actually anything about the world. It's a property of the wiring of the network. And you're not interested in that. That's not going to help you survive in the world, learning about the wiring of the network. So that was the point of positive and negative examples. And actually, it's a big problem for this whole class of learning algorithms that seem pretty sensible, which is take some data, look for some correlational structure in the data, take those hidden activities, and now look for correlational structure in those hidden activities, and just keep doing that layer by layer. 
And if you just do that layer by layer, eventually what you'll be doing is discovering correlations that are due to the weights of the network, not due to what's going on in the input. It's a problem when you stack Boltzmann machines. Um, they can partially overcome it by, they're very good at modeling the structure of the wiring in the layer below. In fact, you can initialize them with a model of this wiring in the layer below by just using the transpose weights for the next layer. And then they'll learn on top of that, but they're already using most of their capacity to model the wiring. So you really need to use positive and negative data to avoid modeling your own wiring. The most successful set of contrastive methods at present are methods like Simply. There's a whole bunch of methods developed by many different groups and Simply wasn't the first of them. Actually, the very first of them was by Hinton and Becker in 1992, um, but that had a bad way of doing the contrast. Um, and Simclear, what Simclear does is take two random crops of the same image and says, I want to have a deep neural network, a convolutional network that's deep, that will extract a representation of each of those random crops so the representations are similar. So for two random crops that come from the same network, I want similar representations. And for two random crops that come from different, sorry, from different images, if they come from the same image, similar representations. If they come from different images, I want different representations. That's the contrast. Those are the negative examples. And that is very good at learning representations that tell you a lot about what's going on in the image. Um, it's got a number of problems though. The crops have to be randomly located in the image. If you always locate them in the same place, and that's what you'd be doing if you had some fixed architecture, then it can cheat. All it has to do if they're always in the same place is just report the intensity of the pixel that they share. Um, it doesn't have much constraint per patch pair because all it has to do is tell where they come from the same image. And if you have a million images, that only takes 20 bits. And it requires backpropagation. That's the biggest drawback. It has this deep network to extract the representations that's using backpropagation. So that's how those me contrastive methods are different. The thing that's most similar is a generative adversarial net. And generative adversarial nets, like Boltzmann machines um, and noise contrast est estimation, have the idea of positive and negative data. So in a GAN, you have two models, and that's what makes it complicated. There's a discriminative model, and the discriminative model gets to look at real images, and it gets to look at images generated by the other network, the generative model, and it tries to tell the difference. So it's just like what's happening in the forward-forward algorithm with positive and negative data, except that it just has a single logistic unit at the final output, and it uses backpropagation in a deep net to make the discrimination. You can think of the forward-forward algorithm as taking the discriminative model of a GAN, having a discriminative model in every layer, um, and so you don't need backpropagation because you're greedily learning a discriminative model in every layer. And then a GAN has a separate generative model that you have to backpropagate the derivatives of the discrimination through um, in order to learn the generative model. So you're trying to learn the generative model so the discriminator can't discriminate. In the forward forward algorithm, what we do is we use the hidden layers of the discriminative model as the hidden representations of a generative model. So all the generative model needs to do, that's these top-down connections, all, that, all it needs to do is learn these top-down connections, um, and then it'll have a generative model. And that solves several of the problems. It doesn't work as well as a GAN yet, but it solves some of the problems of a GAN. It doesn't need backpropagation. And also, it's not adversarial learning. You haven't got these two models competing with each other because they're sharing their hidden representations. So the optimization is much easier. It also eliminates mode collapse. So in a GAN, the generative model can generate very, very nice images, but in only one tiny part of the domain and just ignore large, large sets of real data. And it's hard to prevent a GAN doing that. In the forward forward algorithm, it can't do that because the 
hidden representations are learned on real data. And so the generative model will always have hidden representations for all of the real data. It can't ignore a part of the space. And that's the end of my talk. Now, there's one more thing. Since I've got five minutes left, there's one more thing I wanted to mention, which I think will be of particular interest to statisticians. Um, and I think I left it in here. Did I leave it in here? Yes. OK. So the first contrastive learning I mentioned was done by a graduate student of mine and me, and it was published in Nature in 1992. Um, and what we did was we took two stereo images and overlaid them. And then we took a crop in one location of both images and a crop of both images in another location that didn't overlap. And we tried to train a neural network to extract similar representations. Now, if the stereo pair was what are called random dot stereograms, where the only structure is that the, it looks like a surface in depth. So the offsets of points have regularities. The points themselves are random, but the offsets to points in the other image have a regularity. So that's a fourth order statistical regularity because it involves four points to say what's regular. That if there's a, a pair of points with this offset in this, this patch, in a nearby patch, there should be a pair of points with a similar offset. Um, if the surface depth is roughly constant. That's a fourth order regularity. And we learn to extract, if we gave it random dot stereograms, it learned to extract depth. Um, we had to have non-overlapping crops to avoid cheating. And instead of using negative examples, so on the positive examples, on two crops and real images, we tried to make them have similar representations. That was a positive example. But instead of negative examples, we tried to do the negative examples analytically. So we tried to say, we want them to be similar when they're two crops from the same image. And we want them to be similar relative to the distributions of those representations over all images. And we explicitly said we want to maximize the mutual information between these two representations. And to have high mutual information, um, they've got to be similar for similar images and dissimilar for dis different images. It's no use them being the same all the time. That, that's not high mutual information. And if the distributions were Gaussian, you can compute the entropy of a Gaussian distribution. And it's just the log of the determinant of the covariance matrix for a multivariate Gaussian. And so what we tried to do was for positive pairs, we would take the difference and we would try to make that difference have a small log of the determinant of the covariance matrix. And for the individual things, we try and make them have a, either the individual things or the sums. We actually took the differences versus the sums. We try and make the sums have a big log of the determinant of the covariance matrix. And it sort of worked, but it didn't work that well. And we didn't understand why. And it took me about 20 years to understand what we'd done wrong. Um, and I can now explain to you what we'd done wrong. And it's interesting to statisticians, I think. So this is my attempt to say something that hardline statisticians might not know and might be interested in. What we really wanted, what we really wanted to do was get high entropy for the sum of the two representations and low entropy for the difference of the two representations. And then they'd have had high mutual information. If you have a linear transformation of data, so if I take some data and I apply any linear transformation to it, it doesn't have to be Gaussian, it can be distributed any way that you like. If you apply a linear transformation, it's a continuous distribution. You don't alter the ratio of the entropy to the variance. A Gaussian is the distribution that has the highest variance for a given entropy. Sorry, the highest entropy for a given variance. Um, but so if you, if you take a Gaussian and you apply a linear transformation, it stays Gaussian. If you take something that's non-Gaussian and you apply, apply a linear transformation, it stays non-Gaussian. But the ratio between the entropy and the variance doesn't change. And because of that, if you're optimizing any linear function and you want to 
manipulate the entropy, which is a hard thing to measure, you can manipulate the variance instead. And that's what you're really doing in methods like linear discriminant analysis or canonical correlation analysis. You really want high entropy, but you're going for high variance. And for linear transformations, they're the same thing. But as soon as you try and optimize a nonlinear transformation, then a nonlinear transformation can change the ratio between entropy and variance. And therefore, you can't manipulate entropy reliably by manipulating variance. And what Sue Becker and I were trying to do was get high entropy by getting high variance. And that's fine for linear transformations, no good for nonlinear transformations. So for example, if I have two, two tight clusters, very tight clusters, each is a little Gaussian, and I just move those Gaussians further apart, keeping each Gaussian the same, but just move them further apart, I haven't changed the entropy, but I've changed the variance. And if I move a long way apart, I've got very high variance now, but I didn't change the entropy at all. So what we eventually learned is you can't, if, you, if you're in, really interested in manipulating entropy, you have to use actual negative examples. You can't do it analytically by operating on properties like variance. Um, I think that's interesting to statisticians. That, that explains why there isn't a nonlinear generalization of linear discriminant analysis. And there isn't a nonlinear generalization of canonical correlation analysis. There's generalizations where you first apply nonlinear transformation to the data and then do the linear thing. But when you do the optimization, you better be optimizing a linear function if you're using variance to control entropy. Okay, now I'm really finished. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hinton, for the nice informative talk, which <coughs> outlined the very attractive alternative to the conventional back propagation as we knew it, and the more biologically plausible alternative as well. Now, uh, may I request uh, online participants, if you want to ask a question, please type it in the chat, and the Offline participants who are present in the auditorium, if you want to ask a question, please, this is the time when you can do that. Okay. Any questions from uh, the participants present here? Anyone want to ask any question? Uh, and I'll check the chat if there is something here. The so online participants kindly type your question in the chat. Yeah, you want to ask one question? Uh, hi, sir. Uh, can you hear me, sir? Am I audible? I can only just hear you. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> so I just have one question regarding this forward forward algorithm. Uh, that is, uh, you talked about a goodness function in the uh, previous, in, in some, in, in, in a slide, and there is one threshold which you are defining. So, uh, above the threshold is, it's a G, which is a goodness function, goodness function, and it is a uh, positive pair, and below this threshold, it is negative pair. So, how can we get that threshold for uh, different data distribution? Can you just say the last bit of the question again and say it slowly and loudly? Yeah. Uh, so, sir, uh, you talked about a goodness function, and yes. that goodness function is actually uh, decided by a threshold. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, how can we actually measure that that threshold in case of uh, different data distribution? Um, basically, once you've set the threshold, it'll learn the parameters to work with that threshold. So, the th you could learn the threshold. But if you just fix the threshold fairly arbitrarily, it'll learn parameters so the good ones have a goodness higher than the threshold and the bad ones have a goodness lower than the threshold. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there is one question here. Uh, while using the forward-forward algorithm, how about the inference? In fact, when we try to infer, Let's say the label of M is digit. Uh, 
So do we need to combine every, or do we need to try all image level combinations? And then should we check for which combination the network activations are highest or the network is most, most excited? Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I heard the question right, but let me repeat something I said, which is you can just choose bad labels at random. Um, but it's much better if you choose the labels that the network's most likely to get get wrong. And so you do that, you can do that by taking an image and first running it through the net and getting it to give you a distribution. And then for a positive example, you use the correct label. For a negative example, you pick the label from the distribution, but excluding the correct example. So if it's confusing a seven with a nine, sevens and nines are very confusable. Um, the negative example for a seven will typically be a nine and the negative example of a nine will typically be a seven. And then the network learns much faster. I'm not sure if that answered your question. I think that answers the question. Yeah, the negative examples could be generated in that manner. Any other questions from the audience? Here is one in the chat, the question, okay. Just one moment. There is one question in the chat. Sir, why we are not using CNN? And is it possible to do it with the CNN? Okay. Um, so, everybody asked me that question. Um, you could try doing all this with CNNs. The reason I don't want to use CNNs is because they involve weight sharing. And you can only do weight sharing if you have high power digital hardware. In other words, you need to know for two different neurons in the network, you need to know which weight corresponds to which other weight for these two neurons. If you have irregularly grown hardware, you're just trying to get learning to work in this hardware, you can't do weight sharing. So the brain cannot do weight sharing. And so I want to get something that'll work without weight sharing. So I'm willing to cripple myself to get something more plausible. I'm not trying to get the best performance on data. I'm trying to get something that might be a model of how the brain's working. Yep. Thank you. Uh, I think that answers the question. And uh, one question uh, that comes up is that the forward forward training does not really require the entire forward path to be differentiable. Unlike the back, back, uh, back propagation, isn't it? Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, the forward forward algorithm does not require the entire forward path to be differentiable. Unlike exactly, the back exactly. Yes. Back so, yes. So, here's a big advantage. And I forgot to mention this, but it's a very good question. I should have mentioned it. Um, yeah. Suppose I take one of these networks I'm training with forward forward, and in the middle of the network, I put a black box. So the black box takes the output of one layer, does something with it, and provides the input to the next layer. But I don't know what it does. And what it does might be stochastic, as might be very nonlinear, but it's stationary in the sense that it always does the same thing. And if it's stochastic, it's stationary stochastic. Um, for the forward-forward algorithm, that doesn't make any difference to the learning algorithm. And I've tried it. So you can put in a layer that does random transformation and you don't know what it is um, and you never modify it. And the algorithm learns equally well. For back propagation, you've got a real problem because you have to back propagate through that unknown transformation. And the best you can do is try and build a forward model. So try and build a model of that transformation and back propagate through your model, your differentiable model. But it doesn't automatically just not have a problem with unknown transformations. Whereas the forward forward algorithm is just fine. It doesn't have a problem. Another example where it doesn't have a problem is this. Suppose that each of the neurons I have um, behaves in different ways on different occasions. In fact, not just behaves in different ways, but suppose different neurons are correlated in the different ways they behave. So suppose if you drink alcohol, all of the neurons behave slightly differently. The forward-forward algorithm doesn't have a problem with that. It'll learn fine. 
obviously you have to average the learning over occasions when you've had a drink and occasions when you haven't. Um, but it doesn't need to know what the transformation the neuron's performing is in order to be able to learn. And neurons actually change the transformations, they change their input output properties quite a lot, depending on things in the bloodstream and fatigue and all that kind of thing. And the forward forward algorithm is very robust to all of that, and back propagation isn't. Thank you. Uh, that perfectly elaborates this particular point. There is one question in the chat that uh, there has been lots of deep learning architectures models based on forward backwards path. So does the forward forward will require to change the existing system or if it will complement those? Okay, I don't think it's going to work as well as back propagation when you run it on a digital computer where you can do weight sharing. So the fact that you can share weights between different copies of the hardware allows you to build these great big models, like these big language models wouldn't be possible unless you could share weights between different GPUs and also share weights within a GPU by doing convolution and things like that. Um, but for that to be possible, it's essential for things to behave exactly as they're intended to behave. And that requires you to go digital. And that requires you to use very high power and very precise manufacturing. The realm in which the forward forward algorithm is good is when you want something very cheap and very low power that doesn't have to be manufactured accurately. And for biology, because I think that's the realm biology is in. So I actually believe at present that the deep learning technology we have now is doing something that's more effective than what biology is doing. But it's only possible if you use very high power and digital hardware. Yes, exactly the key. Uh, another last question is, what is the nature of the goodness function? On chat, there is a question, what is the nature of the goodness function? Basically, it can be anything you like. Um, you should try and make it something that's easy to compute and easy to manipulate, easy to get derivatives of. But I've tried um, five different things so far. One is the sum of the squared activities is the goodness in a layer. Another is the sum of the squared activities is the negative goodness. So you want them to be small for positive data and high for negative data. That works actually slightly better. Um, another is the sum of the activities, not the squared activities. But if you use the sum of the activities, then when you normalize it, you don't normalize the length of the vector, you normalize the sum of the components of the vector. So you can use the L1 norm and then you have to normalize the L1 norm. Or you can use the L2 norm and then you have to normalize the L2 norm before you go to the next layer. And the last thing I've used is the difference between the top down input to a layer and the bottom up input to a layer. And that's the thing that worked best for, that's most like contrast, other contrastive learning. And that's what worked best for allowing sleep to be separated from wake, allowing you to do lots of positive updates followed by lots of negative updates. But uh, you. Thanks. You could use any old objective. You could use any old goodness function and try this kind of algorithm. Yeah, exactly. So thank you, Professor Hinton. We will uh, stop here because it's very late at night at your place. As it is, know. yes. <laughs> and uh, thank you once again for uh, joining us at this virtually and for elaborating on this really nice and attractive forward-forward algorithm which, uh, as we perceive, could be implemented on very power-efficient analog circuits even, and that could actually enable us, you know, to run very large language models even in a very time-efficient manner. So, so on behalf of Indian Psychical Institute and Winter School on Deep Learning, uh, we thank you very cordially, and uh, we, uh, we are quite delighted, and all of us benefited from this talk. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you very much. With well, this, we will conclude this session. Thanks a so, lot. And please give a big hand for Professor Hinton. Because you can hear that also. Really nice thank, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye. Good night. Have a good place.
uh, organizer, do you have anything to announce to the rest of the participants? Any any particular point to announce? By the way, there are there were a few other questions in the chat which were very generic and that didn't meant for this forward forward algorithm itself. So we will actually answer these questions while uh, rolling over the course lecture. Okay. So we only entertain those questions which are directly related to prop income stock. Anything to announce? Yeah. So there are a few points to announce which you, you, you should hear, those who have joined uh, uh, online. Okay, so I can get a little bit of 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 a uh, all the other lectures will be through the Zoom link that we have already sent on your mail. If you haven't received it, please mail us. We will uh, resend you the link. And the uh, next session will be from. Oh, I don't. Recording to a shuttle. Bola diye challenge kar diye. Kar diya. Bola diye che. Kya band kar? Wo sab. Kya yahan se band kar Okay, you clean thing fine. So we have phone as well. Travel should make a help this watch our phone. Time is planned. It's an action. It's a kind of put the food. I'm in piney. I'm in the classroom.